So I was fascinated in this context about how much of us become part of the world around us. So when you touch something or put your hand on something or where does the body actually go and where does the world begin? Because through the notion of perspectivalism, we've objectified the world, so we lost our relationship with the world. So pre-Renaissance, they used to say that we would um, um, like wear space like a garment, so a garment was wrapped around you. So you weren't separated, but after perspective, you are separated from the world, you're objectifying the world around you, and there's no relationship to it. So this notion then of an ocular-centric world gets thrown away by a notion of a haptic world. And a haptic world, if you're thinking that, like the cinema, brought us this notion of motion, my bridge and so on, brought us this invisible space of movement, which then brought us the sort of cinema and all those really bad films that we have to watch of instances of time thrown together to appear to be time, which aren't time, and we're all caught by it, and yet still we watch them because they're kind of cool. <laughs> So this is the new camera. So this is an AFM, how an AFM works, an atomic force microscope. And it works like this because of the, the, the spectrum of light. So we can't go down to that small spectrum, although they are manipulating that equation because we see between 400 and 700 kind of nanometers. So this tip is supposed to be about 10 nanometers across at the very point, which is roughly 100 atoms. That's how they scan in this context. So what happens, if you imagine a record player um, in a groove of a record playing music, and the, the top of the needle oscillates, then a laser, in this case, fires off there, goes to a, a diode, and you can plot the, the idea of this. So, I had this idea that I wanted to try and do about touch. So when you touch something, how much of you becomes part of it? Which links to a kind of uh, futurist, I don't know, if you, any of the early futurist manifestos written in relationship to Bergson's theories and so on and so forth about touch and about being part of the world. So like when they were on the trolley bus, they were part of the trolley bus and the trolley bus was part of the street. I was just always fascinated by that kind of idea. So I wanted to see that, and I got interested in this notion then of Drexel's grey goo and the way we pollute the world and nanotechnology. So the idea then was to take something like King Midas, who, you know, everything he wanted to touch turned to gold. You know, he's got, he got this gift. But then, I mean, what do you do with your McDonald's burger? I mean, it's like, oh, God, gold, shit. <laughs> you know, here's something I love, shit, they're gold. So, it becomes a curse straight away. So you have this kind of cool idea, but the idea, but there's still the same thing of this sort of pollution of, of touch, of materiality, of material exchange, of the corruption of material. And so what I did was uh, I tried to scan um, a skin cell, and skin cells are like huge, so uh, in a nano sense, so they're not a good substrate to scan. So this is where science and art kind of separate a little bit in relationship to pure science of, of experiments with this. But, to go back to this, so this is in XYZ mode, where it can scan a sample in a raster scan, backwards and forwards, over the surface, and I'll show you that a bit later. But what else it can do is it can actually just go down on one and touch the surface of a material and record the atomic vibration those sort of hundred atoms on the surface that it's touching. So this gives you the potential then to change that, which is then a frequency of vibration, into a sound wave. So then what I tried to do was say, how do I scan a skin cell? So I grew it on gold to uh, begin with, so I grew a skin cell onto gold and then tried to scan it, but it was too big, it was like scanning hit a mountain, so I go, that's no good. So how do I actually do it? So then I met this guy in Austria who scanned cells for a living, like that was his job at university, he scanned cells. And he was doing it where he was putting antibodies onto the tip and then scanning a cell with antibodies and then scanning one without to see what the atomic difference was. So then he said, why don't you coat it with gold? So then I went back to the physics department and said, can you coat it with cantaloupe? Of course they can. I mean, I never knew that. I mean, it's just like, they put in this thing, vapor gold comes down. <laughs> and you've got a gold cantilever. How cool is that? I mean, I'm so impressed. 
and what they can do. I mean, sometimes in art schools I get really frustrated because we struggle with plaster and materials and stuff, and etching plates, and you go to physics and they can do all this really cool shit with really expensive machines. And the art doesn't tell you that there's new materials and new processes. They still stay with the old ones because there's something about them that is really important due to their process. It's like taking a photograph of the 30th of the second is more important than 500s because you get more of the coming through onto the would-be emulsion that is not emulsion anymore. But still the idea of that time is, that is imbued. So now they've got like 8,000, I mean they've got a trillionth, haven't they? The trillionth of the second camera now. So I mean, what they're going to do, they're going to say, oh, I remember when it was 5 thousandths of a second. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm waffling now. <laughs> um, so this is my minus research, and I did a thing, but this was to try and illustrate that notion of touch and the reorientation of haptics to a reorientation of materiality, and therefore taking it away from that. So then to try and turn that into a work of art. So I got this um, thing, old-fashioned method of straight away doing a rapid prototype model using that, making a mold, putting in metal, covering it with gold. So now they've got nine karat gold plated. Not switch because it's like a sensor. So you put your finger on that and as soon as you did, you would hear the sounds of um, the atoms vibration of skin touching gold from the comparative study with the gold coat from cantilever and not. And while well, my colleague wrote an A-Life um, program that et the red, green, and blue of the image and transferred it to gold. So you became responsible for polluting the image because every time you touched it, it went. And this is the one that was being shown on the things. So this is a lot faster than it happens, but you can see all the little nanobots eating away the, um, the red, green, and blue. So now I'm in painting. This is a painting, by the way, just in case you thought it was media art. This media art's dead. It's all painting now. Just want to make that clear. So, I've got another little video because I thought you'd like that interspersed with this boring stuff in the middle. <laughs> oh, I had the sound off. Burnout people use only 10% of their brains. Sorcerers can manipulate matter because they're born with the capability to use the entire power of their brains, which also explains why molecular physics comes so easily to you. So wait, is, is sorcery science or magic? Yes and yes. <laughs> For now, all you need is a basic combat spell, making fire. What causes molecules to heat up? They vibrate? Everything we see is in a constant state of vibration. That's the illusion of solidity. But how do we take that which appears solid and have it burst into flames? We will the vibrations to go faster. Step one, clear your mind. Step two, see the molecules. Step three, make them shake. Oh! Got it? No, I, I definitely don't got it. Trust the ring, Dave. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty cool. How many times did you want to do that? Like you wanted to point to something and you go zap because your mind turns. I love that stuff. I love it. <laughs> you always want to do that, you know, to matter, you know, to make, to control matter. Um, so I became really interested then that, like, if you imagine the Sandman and then Midas and then trying to find out, like, touch and so on. And I started reading a lot more about nanotechnology and um, it. Um, I was always disturbed, and I was disturbed by this report in 2000 to the American government about nanotechnology, because it seemed to sort of suggest something about being human that was sort of strange, that our value as human beings was total street value, not much. <laughs> So that's the report to the government where you say, well, oh shit, we can get rid of that. <laughs> Total street value, not very much at all. So I'm thinking that, you know, like, okay, that if, if nano now can create nano symbols, and if you can have like a dot matrix printer that's going to be able to print anything, then if you can make a, a body like the golem or something like that, then 
um, how do you get life into it? So how are they going to put life? So I became interested in that. So I started to ask the question of where life exists at a narrow level. And then, of course, I touched on God, who's the first nano assembler, as far as I know. <laughs> I don't know of anybody who's like, that's uh, cool. But once you've built Adam out of dust particles, atoms, um, <laughs> he, um, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't get him to do anything because he was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I just like sat there on the floor and just did nothing. So God had to go up and breathe into his nostrils, which is a good thing he designed them <laughs> in the first place, which starts to put certain elements of creation into perspective, I think. But, so life has to be transmitted. So I got really interested in this notion of transmission of life and the notion of nano building. It's like when you know, the Sandman goes to pieces and comes back together. I mean, who would have thought that he'd still be the Sandman? I mean, he could have chosen somebody else. And if you're going to do that, why not, why not come back as somebody who's really cool? I mean, Sam, that might be cool, but I mean, he was just nasty. He was just mean. He didn't need to be mean. So, I went and tried to find out how to how I'd go about that. So I went back to the symbiotical where I did the first work um, with Midas, and uh, talked to Aaron, and we decided to go with Hackett cells. And Hackett cells are kind of interesting because they're a mortal cell line. They've been manipulated, engineered. So they keep on repeating themselves at every night and the scientists want them. Now I tried to find out where Hackett was and who Hackett was, and so I could apologize to him in advance for, for manipulating with his skin cells, because a lot of people manipulate the skin cells, but they don't seem to ever worry about who gave the skin cells to the science, they just seem to manipulate them. Like that American woman who you all know about, which I can't remember her name, who's now got a bigger body weight of what they grew of her after she died of cancer. They now so there's but so the Hackett cell was just, that's what it is, and you can order them online, I think if you're in the biology, biology departments. But they become confluent on a mica substrate, like over a weekend, which so for growing it's really cool. Um, so what I wanted to do was then take that, put that into, um, in vitro, into a atomic force microscope, we see the force of microscopes are tiny little things. It's so under embarrassingly small. You know, you want this sort of machine, it's like, <laughs> like the Volvo machine. You know, that's like the machine, you put this little thing, and that's where you, that's where you put the, um, the liquid, um, which is resting on a, um, down there, the little cantilever things, which is just the, um, where their base is, they have a little triangle point on the end. See that? Anyway, there's a, and in the top of the pink is where I transported them from the biological lab to the chemistry lab. To, and so I wanted to try and uh, then scan that um, um, for a period of time um, until the skin, the skin died, perished, um, so that I could start to see the difference between living and dead. And so then I knew what the, the sort of nano level ish, what what skin cells were, I mean what life was. And then I also wanted to record it. So if you can see there, there's a death. There's ether in a, in a in injection. And so as I'm scanning it using the sound thing that I spoke of before, I actually inject it with ether. So the actual skin dies instantly. So then you get two different things. And they come up like this, which is a force spectroscopy and a process that they call it. Um, so this is the cantilever coming down, this is it getting stuck to the surface, and this is it pulling away and recording the vibrations. 